Chapter 6. Conversations with Black People Sometimes I wonder what it would be like to walk into a store and not be subtly, but not so subtly followed. Sometimes I wonder what it would feel like to get pulled over by the police and not have a mild panic attack. Sometimes I wonder what it would be like to apply for a job and not worry that the EOE race affirmation isn't the thing that causes me to not get the job. Sometimes, I wonder what it would be like to get a promotion on the first attempt, without having to work five times harder than everyone else on the team. Sometimes, I wonder if, God forbid, I found myself in court on the stand as a defendant if I get the same treatment as someone who doesn't look like me. I wonder about these things because I've seen too many times where people who look like me are often denied certain things just because of the color of their skin. But this is a song I'm all too familiar with, one I've heard again and again, and no matter how many times I hear it, I've resigned myself to the fact that these feelings aren't going anywhere. In chapter one, I explain that I still have hope in mankind. I still have hope that there are people, namely white people, who want to see racial equality as much as I do. I know they exist. I've seen them on the internet. I've seen them in the streets, but... Like the voices of black people, those voices are often falling on deaf ears, especially to the people who actually have the ability to enact change. After the murder of George Floyd, a picture of the Democratic leadership was widely circulated. In this picture, the Speaker of the House and several key members of Congress knelt down in the state capitol wearing kente stoles. My initial reaction was of hope. Remember, George Floyd's death changed everything. People were starting to see how much of an effect racism was having on black America. But what's more, the racist people were being brought into the light. My reaction of hope soon dissolved because the people who literally have the power to write and propose legislation that would help mitigate the racial tensions in this country did exactly nothing. They dressed up for a photo op and that was the last we heard of it. In previous episodes, we've discussed the how and why, so for this episode, I wanted to explore the where. I want to drop all the pretenses and explore where racism exists in our society, aside from, you know, the people themselves. Arguably, I couldn't do this on my own. I needed help, so with the help of a close friend, I had an intimate conversation about being black while also in America. From the Hyman Blog and Press Play Podcast, I'm J.D. Hyman. As a black man living here in America, I am living proof that while all men were created equal, not all men are equal. We're here to dig into the American political system, explore and unearth experiences from the human experience, and be a catalyst for some hard conversations that need to be had. No matter what brought you here, I'm glad you came. Once again, my name is J.D. and this is the Hyman Podcast. Part 1. Meet Donald Glenn In an upcoming episode, I'm going to go into detail about my own personal journey with racism. I know, I know, I've touched on some specific examples, but I'm going to go into greater detail. In that episode, I'll explore my feelings as they were associated with racism, how I became jaded by people who didn't really even know me, how I developed a persona that acted without inhibition and struck down anyone who dared to challenge my place in this world. Maybe even find an absolution. But the thing is, I'm hardly alone in this fight. There is an entire race of people out there and how those other people try to cope or come to terms with the way they had been treated is just as important as how I came to terms and how I cope. So I set out to have conversations with other black people to learn about their experiences with racism both in and outside the workplace. I set out to have conversations with multiple people, but after talking to Donald, I knew it was evident that this entire episode was going to revolve around his story. And good thing, because it was one of those conversations that needed to happen for both of us. Donald, in some capacity, for the past decade has worked in higher education, specifically in student life and more specifically in diversity and inclusion. 
Over the years, he has trained hundreds of college students, staff, faculty in diversity, inclusion, leadership, and service. He is an ordained minister and currently he's working on his doctorate degree. I met Donald in the fall of 2008 at Ohio Christian University. He's had both similar and wildly different experiences than I do. I won't go into detail on his story. I won't tell it for him. Instead, I'll let you hear it in his words. I guess my story starts in college. I guess that was where my first memory where I can really remember racism or it happening to me or me feeling like uh, I was singled out because of my race or my beliefs. It was my freshman year at a small school in uh, central Ohio. It was one morning I woke up and on my room, dorm room door was a photograph of Barack Obama's then candidate Barack Obama, uh, his face. And over his face was drawn a swastika, uh, you know, the, the Nazi symbol. All I know is, you know, those two together, that, that wasn't a good thing. When Barack Obama was announced the winner of the election, wow, that was a moment uh, that I'll never forget, mainly because there was a small group of African Americans who were just exploding with, um, <laughs> with joy to see the first African American president that the United States have ever seen. So it's the, it, it was a historic moment for us. And I remember walking past the cafeteria and I noticed that the furniture in the cafeteria had been turned over um, as if somebody somewhere was not too happy. <laughs> I remember this night that Donald's describing very clearly. It was actually November 4th, 2008, the night of the 2008 presidential election. On the heels of what would become an historic night, which saw the election of the nation's first black president, a number of people were none too happy to witness this, least of all the collective conservative members of the student body. That night, as the polls began reporting in the wake of all the mayhem that was brewing on campus, my roommate and I decided to take a drive and grab a bite to eat. And when we came back, the Associated Press was reporting that Barack Obama had won the election. As we approached the dorm, I remember two guys were sitting out back, crying. There had been a lot of turmoil on campus. My fear was that that turmoil had escalated into physical violence. I didn't know what to think. And when I asked what was wrong, they gave me two words in between sobs. Obama won. At the time, I had zero political acumen and I would never understand why this was the reaction until I saw the reaction of everyone who voted for Hillary Clinton after she lost the presidential race to Donald Trump exactly eight years later. Seeing people break down on national TV is unnerving, and many people, including the cast of MSNBC, were devastated. I don't want to use the term riot because we're seeing real riots, right? But man, if I could have described it that night, I would have called it a riot. I mean, can you imagine the, the probably some of six or seven African-American uh, students at this predominantly white institution? Though it was a small school, I mean, it, it still was a significant uh, a number. And could you imagine the small group of African-Americans or minority students on one side of a line? And then on the other side, you have a, just a row, a, a, a continuous seemingly line of, of, of majority Americans yelling. I vividly remember being yelled at and someone, and I believe it was the same individual who put Obama's face on my door, said the words, and I'm going to not say those expletives on today, but he said, F you and F Obama too. Whoa. And yelled it down the hall at me and, and the others. I'm like, now you don't know if I voted for Obama. You don't know if I voted for, <laughs> but F me and Obama too. I left in March of 2019. And I enjoyed every opportunity to be able to, to speak into different areas. But 
when I was hired uh, as a professional staff to oversee the multicultural office, uh, so that same position that I ran to when I uh, found trouble, I, I was able to occupy only uh, a few years later. And even then, there were still challenges, but we were able to continue to have conversation. And I think that's what was missing and, and allowing both sides of the story to be heard, uh, both opinions to be expressed, and it at least gives each party the opportunity to understand the other. Uh, I remember uh, uh, my senior year, my second senior year, this was before I was hired, we had the opportunity to do a, a debate uh, ahead of the 2012 election. And I think that debate was really pivotal because it, again, allowed both sides to share uh, their, their, their stories and their opinions. And, and, and I, I guess one of the key lessons that I learned when I took over the role was the art of listening and how important it is to be able to have conversations and honest conversations where you don't have to beat around the bush or not talk about the elephant that you know is in the room. And I've, I really just tried to start to have those conversations. And then, in the same fashion as they did me, people came out of the woodwork, their eyes now thrown open by recent events. We'll hear more from Donald after the break. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. Hey everyone, it's Cameron Justice, co-host of the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast. Make sure you check us out for everything Browns. We got you covered before the game, after the game. Here are our takes, here are our feedback, here are our criticisms and our praises. If you like the Browns, you're going to love this podcast. And I'm Dennis Maniloff, co-host along with the roadman, Kenny Rhoda of the Next Man Up podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Roadman and I do a deep dive into Browns, Indians, Cavs, Ohio State, and anything else that's on the sports fan's mind. I think that is profoundly sad, uh, some of the experiences that I had as a professional. Uh, when, I, when people now, since I have left that place, uh, have reached out. I mean, a lot of people have Facebooked me. People that I don't even text me. I don't even know if this is your number anymore. Um, apologizing. But then there has been a lot more recently that have come in light, of, I think, of all that we've seen in our city streets and acro across America uh, that have reached out and says, in all caps, I am sorry. We saw how you were being treated. People have said this. I saw, we saw how you were being treated. We did not say enough. We did not do enough. And that is on us. Now, I'm not saying that people are perfect, but certainly as an adult, somebody older than me, you can tell when somebody is being mistreated. You can tell when somebody is not given the resources that they deserve, that they need to be successful, the, the support that they need. While I appreciate the apologies now, the help would have been very helpful way back when. And, and moving on to where I'm at now, total different atmosphere, total different support. Um, the resources are there. Uh, the people are there. Uh, one of them mentioned in the meeting saying, you know, it's really difficult for African-Americans in general, uh, but specifically African-American males, and probably even harder for African-American females to get positions in higher education and to really move up and, 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 and up the ladder. Um, and we have to work to be able to do that almost twice as hard or maybe even three or four times as hard as, as our white counterparts um, just to be recognized. And I have experienced that um, firsthandedly. I have experienced that uh, that feeling of I am doing everything that I possibly can do, yet nobody here is, is seeing me. And then Donald said something that 
truly resonated with something deep inside me. We were deep into a conversation about the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter versus Blue Lives Matter debate. And he said something that can only be best said in his own voice. But if I'm a police officer, I can go home and take off my uniform. Me being a black man, I will never be able to take off my blackness. And that is what people are, are missing. I will leave you with two statements. Number one, what's ridiculous to me is this thought, that there are more black men in prison today that were enslaved in 1850. To, to, for people to say those statements, because what they don't understand is that they are living in that reality. We're not talking about slavery anymore. And I wish we could say we're not talking about lynching, um, but we, we are still seeing it happen, happening um, today. Uh, don't wait to apologize and years later to have regret and say, I wish I would have, I'm sorry. But stand up now. If you see something, say something. And I know these are difficult conversations to have. And while many spaces around the world, many churches and institutions are having these things called safe spaces. It might be a safe space, but I'm not going to be responsible if the conversation is not, because it is going to be uncomfortable. It is going to be difficult. And that's when you're discussing with, you know, black on black, <laughs> uh, like what we're doing today, or when you're having the conversation with people who have different ideas than you. Uh, like I said, times may be challenging, um, but th there's a lot that we can learn from each other still. Epilogue. When I came up with the concept of this episode, I had no idea the conversation I would have would be all that it was. The thing is, it was just the beginning. Donald and I's conversation was a tipping point. He brought up and we addressed issues that are relevant to the black community. Issues that if left on their own will remain unresolved. There's something about the unresolved nature of these issues that in and of themselves is quite unnerving. One thing we talked about was what our lives were like before George Floyd. Did we know we were in the middle of a civil rights movement? Did we know this battle was going to carry on the way it has? Did we know we'd be entrenched in it? Not really. We knew that with the growing number of unarmed black people killed by the police and the rampant and blatant racism both in the workplace and in the streets was at some point going to be a problem. We knew that we weren't going to be able to exist without some noise being made, but we never imagined it would be this. The difference now is that everyone sees it. Everyone has a phone and everyone's recording it and everyone is aware of what's happening. Well, for the most part, there is still a special group of people who choose to ignore the issues that black America faces. And while I'm certain I know some of them, many of them will never reveal themselves to me. One thing that Donald and I talked about was the fact that we have to work twice as hard to get ahead. And I understand that on a deeply personal level. It's also very sad. So often we get boxed into places at school or work and we are forced to reconcile the nature of the people who essentially control our lives. We know we will never measure up and I don't say that to elicit empathy, it's a fact of life. One that I've come to terms with and one that I'm sure Donald and so many others have as well. Watching people that look like me get gunned down has been heart wrenching. My friends by and large stayed silent on the issue. They never asked me about my mental and emotional state. They never checked in on me. They never tried to understand the pain and anguish I'd felt over the years. And it was only recently that many of them realized that there was a pain and that I was burdened by it. The positive side of all of this is that Donald, like myself, made it out, albeit not without scars, but I consider us to be the lucky ones. Between what I've learned and what I've seen, life is not getting any easier anytime soon. I guess, in some fashion or another, all we can do is brace for impact. And when the crash happens, and it will, 
we'll know then what we're made of. My name is J.D. Hyman, and this is the Hyman Podcast. I'll see you next time. This episode of the Hyman Podcast was written and produced by myself with additional copy editing and story editing by Emily Stacy. Kevin Aki is our brand designer, and the music for this episode was composed and produced by Jim Yosef and Raphael Crux. Additional music was licensed from Epidemic Sound. The Hyman Podcast is produced in part by Press Play Podcast. Press Play is staffed by Chase Smith, our CEO and fearless leader. I serve as the Chief Operating Officer, and Brooks May is the Head of Content and Development. To learn more about the network, sponsorships, guest appearances, or if you're interested in launching your own podcast on our network, visit us on the web at www.pressplaypodcast.com. Promotional consideration for this season of the Hyman Podcast was paid for by Blank Shell Gaming, Grant Furnace Designs, and Buds and Bloom New York. To learn more about this podcast, our mission and vision, as well as our sponsors, check us out on the web at www.jdhyman.com.